Hey, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. We are just going to give it about 30 seconds just so I can see all the numbers going up just to let everyone connect. But a big thank you for joining today's TCF 2.2 webinar for CMPs. And we have just come straight from our TCF 2.2 webinar for vendors, which took place in the last hour. Um, as many of you are aware, with the switch over to TCF 2.2, about a month ago, we hosted an overview of the main changes that took place for the technical specifications and the policies. We've got those up on our website so you can watch those full recordings. And from that, we produced an FAQ document, which has got at its latest count, I can't even imagine how many questions and answers there are in there, but it is very full. Um, just from our previous vendor one, we had about 40 questions come through. So we'll be reviewing those, adding those questions in, and we'd love to do the same for today. So um, the first part of today's webinar will be a presentation, and we are really honoured to have members of the TCF steering group who'll be walking you through some of those changes, for, um, especially for CMPs. And then at the end of the session, we'll be opening up the floor to you so that you can ask any questions that you may have. You'll see at the very bottom of the interface, there's a little Q&A box. So please post your questions in there. Um, and then my colleague, Gosha, will be moderating that session and we'll be, we'll be going through. So with that, just to, just to let everyone know, um, I think I've mentioned we are live, but we are recording this. We will post the full recording onto our website along with a copy of these slides so that you've got that. So um, over to you, Gosha. Okay, thank you, Helen, for the introduction. Uh, I would also welcome everyone who has joined us today. And I would also welcome our speakers uh, that I'm going to introduce now. Uh, our speakers are the members of the policy uh, TCF Working Group. The group works on development and revising TCF policies, and all of our speakers are really active within the group, so uh, you, you can be sure that they are experts when it comes to the issues regarding TCF, uh, and they are going to provide you with the overview for the upcoming changes for the CMPs. So we have today with us Frances Hudson, VP of Product from SourcePoint, Julia Stancampiano, product, uh, product Legal Manager at Ubenda, Thomas Adumo, Chief Privacy Officer at Didomi, Peter Craddock, Partner at Keller and Heckman LLPP. Also during the Q&A session, there is going to join us uh, Nino Wagner, our uh, Privacy di Director. And just to underline that, I think Helen mentioned that, but this webinar is a bit limited when it comes to the scope. It's mostly focused on the changes for CMPs. So if you want a bit broader uh, scope, please refer to our website. As Helen said, we hosted some time ago uh, the webinars with the general overview for the TCF policies and technical specifications. So on our website, you can find the webinars that were uh, recorded at that time. And also on Monday, we are going to have uh, one extra one for publishers. So just to uh, underline this fact. Okay, may I have the, the next slide? Okay, so before going uh, to the agenda, uh, I would also underline that uh, TCF version 2.2 is uh, the iteration is focused on uh, sorry on the improvement of the information and controls provided to the end users. Also, uh, the TCF working group uh, just wanted to develop the new version that is um, as as much as it is possible in compliance with the recent uh, data protection authority guidelines and case law. So today we will start with the implementation timeline. Then our experts are going to talk about the upcoming, about the changes for CMPs. Uh, the first one will be disclosure of the number of vendors. Next one is improvement of the existing user facing standard text, uh, standardization of the new information about vendors, improved policies on withdrawal of consent, and changes to the TCF, uh, TCF API comments. Also, we are going to talk a bit about the improved and expanded uh, TCF compliance programs. And at the very end of this webinar, we are going to have a Q&A session and we are going to answer for your questions live. And we, if we won't manage to answer for all of them, uh, they are going to be recorded and then uh, answered in a separate uh, FAQ document. So be sure that all your questions are going to be answered. If not live, then 
uh, we are going to upload to our website the, uh, the rest of them. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, please the next one. <laughs> okay, so the implementation timeline. Uh, so TCF version um, 2.2 was released on May 16th and it contains the um, updates for the TCF policies as well as the technical specifications that were developed with the IAB Tech Lab. Uh, the next really important um, date is June 30th, which is deadline for vendors to update the registration. And it's important from the CMP's point of view because some of the new information required from vendors now will be also obligatory to disclose in the user-facing CMP UIs. Also, the new uh, GVL list is currently available. It is already published weekly. Uh, the next one is actually the reminder because we sent the communication in January this year about the fact that the consensus.org subdomain is going to be revoked. So please make sure that you uh, don't host any script on this uh, on the subdomains of this website anymore. And the last one is a deadline to support uh, TCF version 2.2, which means that basically all your live installations needs to be in compliance with the new version of the TCF uh, policies. Um, and I think uh, that's all for now. So I think we can now give the floor to our speakers. And I think the first slide was for Toma. Thank you, Gosha. Um, so first, we're going to cover the, the disclosure of the, the number of vendors uh, in the, the CMP notice, in the CMP UI. So in the initial layer of the, the user interface, um, publishers and CMPs are required to, uh, to disclose the number of, of vendors that are seeking consent or uh, pursuing data processing purposes based on the, the, their legitimate interest. Uh, this information should, of course, be presented to, to users as clearly as possible. Um, and an example of statement could be, we and our X number of uh, partners store and access blah, 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 information on your device. Uh, so the the number should reflect the the number of tcf vendors um but it could also include the non tcf vendors um that's the the publisher's decision uh and so cmps should actually uh, incorporate that feature um in their in their uh, presumably in their in their uh tools um, then moving on to the secondary uh, layer of the ui uh publishers are also going to be um uh, expected to disclose the number of vendors seeking consent or uh, again pursuing data processing purposes um, based on their legitimate interest and they're they're going to have to disclose that information for each purpose each specific purpose um, so uh, at this point there is uh, ideally a link that will allow users to see who these vendors are uh, so relying on this specific so on purpose one for instance um, to simplify the process uh, for publishers, uh, commercial uh, CMPs uh, are definitely encouraged to uh, automatically uh, compute the number of vendors for their clients uh, when publishers select a subset of vendors. Um, and, uh, and so the... Uh, that's that's because the automation reduces the burden on publishers and also I think encourage um, or ensures uh, accurate and, and up to date information uh, is provided to users. So in conclusion, publishers are required to present this information. So the the number of vendors in both the initial and the secondary layer of the UI and CMP uh, should be able to assist their publishers in automatically uh, computing the the number of vendors. We can move on to the next slide. Hi, yes, thank you to me. Uh, the new policy uh, provides um, new names for the TCF purposes and features and introduce new and more detailed user-friendly descriptions that replace entirely the current legal tags that will be removed. 
um, CMPs are therefore required to use the new standard names or stacks, uh, make available in a secondary layer the corresponding user-friendly descriptions and related illustrations that are indicative examples of operation covered by a given purpose, which can help and user understand in practice how their data can be processed and why. Um, the TCF policies provide publisher with flexibility to modify or supplement standard illustrations under certain conditions, including the requirement to flag such change in the TC string. Um, the use non-standard tax field has been expanded and renamed uh, use non-standard tax for, for such purpose. Um, there is also a new purpose 11, uh, use limited data to select content equivalent to the ad related purpose 2 uh, that is intended to cover processing activities such as the selection and delivery of non advertising content based on real time data. It does not cover the creation or use of profiles to select personalized content. Um, the new standard names, user-friendly descriptions, and uh, the illustrations are already available in the, in the GVL, uh, while the translation will be made available uh, progressively uh, at the link provided in, in the slide. Great, thank you. So in, in order to improve the transparency of disclosures made to users within the TCF, some new information has been added to the list of disclosures vendors must make as part of their registration on the GBL. These new disclosures will need to be included within the CMP UI. Um, a new dedicated taxonomy has been created to, cat to categorize the types of data that are collected and processed by vendors. 11 categories have been created, such as IP addresses um, or device identifiers. Each of the categories is accompanied by a user-friendly description. In the CMP UI, CMPs are required to disclose the categories of data that each vendor is collecting and processing along with the user-friendly descriptions. Hand back to Julia. Thank you. Um, CMPs now are required to display in a secondary layer the data retention periods declared by vendors on a per-purpose basis. Uh, the value is expressed in days inside GBL. And when the retention is less than one day or data is only maintained during the session, the value declared will be zero. Where vendors indicate the same retention period for several purposes at the registration level, a standard retention period is computed automatically in the GVL. And the standard retention period means uh, the vendor has the same retention periods for most of the purposes it has declared, and all the exceptions will be reflected in the purposes and special purposes fields uh, of the data retention object. CMPs may convert uh, retention period provided by vendors in days into a different time unit, uh, for example, in months, the same way they may currently do so with the vendor maximum device storage duration. Um, this transparency requirement is not applicable to purpose one, which is not a data processing purpose in itself, but correspond to the obligation of Article 5, Paragraph 3 of the ePrivacy Directive. Um, next slide. Um, the GDPR requires that the controller to provide information about the legitimate interest they pursue, and the new policies aims to make this information more easily accessible by users. Uh, therefore, in addition to providing a link to their privacy policies, vendor will also provide a dedicated link that redirects to an explanation of their legitimate interest at stake when they pursue at least one purpose or special purpose under this legal base. This uh, URL can be a bookmark anchor uh, with vendors' privacy policies or a standalone web page. And CMPs will be able to retrieve this URL from the GVL to supplement disclosures about vendors. So I think that's my turn now. Um, so, um... In, uh, th there was a need for vendors to actually uh, communicate effectively with, uh, with all their users, uh, no matter their language. And so now vendors have the, uh, have the ability to declare multiple URLs uh, for their privacy documentation um, so that users can access it. Uh, and with each URL designated for a specific lang language. Um, so what's uh, what's really good with this uh, is that URL are conveniently uh, stored in the, the GVL. So that's going to be easy for CMPs to access them. 
Uh, and this means that a user interacting with the UI in Spanish, for instance, uh, can be provided with a link to uh, uh, the privacy documentation or privacy policies in Spanish as well. Um, there might be cases where vendors have not uh, declared uh, URLs for their privacy documentation in the specific language used by specific users. There are many languages in, uh, in Europe. And so in such instances, um, CMPs have the ability or like the flexibility to provide uh, links to the vendor's documentation in a different language or, or like resort to a, a default language. Um, having said all that, uh, I think instead of having uh, multiple URLs uh, for each language, uh, I would myself ref recommend vendors, uh, if there are any on this webinar, um, to actually just create a, a single uh, smart page where um, where users are going to land uh, and uh, and create um, and just select the language based on the, the language used by the user at the browser level. Uh, I'm not saying this just so so to make it uh, easier for CMPs to uh, um, to to implement the changes of the TCF uh, version 2.2. It's it's also more because of um, I mean links uh, can always change. Uh, there could be broken links. Having one single uh, link uh, pointing to the privacy documentation is, is in my view, uh, more efficient. Uh, and so instead of being done at the, the CMP level, uh, the information is actually, the language is actually selected at the, the, at the, the vendor's page or website uh, level. Great. So um, publishers using your CMP will need to ensure that users can re-access the CMP UI easily to manage their choices. For example, this could be via a floating icon or a footer link or um, via the top level settings of an app. Um, if the initial consent message which is presented to users contains a call to action that enables the user to consent to all purposes and vendors in one click, such as like an accept all or a consent to all button, an equivalent call to action should be provided when users resurface the CMP UI to withdraw consent to all purposes and vendors in one click, such as a withdraw consent to all. The TCF version 2.2 does not require that CMPs provide a call to action for users to refuse consent from the first layer of their UIs. However, publishers and their CMPs should ensure they're fully aware of their local data protection authority requirements and act accordingly. And I think the next one is fine as well. Um, so the TCF policies already require vendors to respect TCF signals on an individual basis in real time and not to rely on a stored version of a previously received signal. In order to pro, um, further the effectiveness of this policy and ensure vendors on TCF version 2.2 are using event listeners, the get TC data command is being deprecated. As a result, CMPs are no longer required to support the get TC data command. However, the three API commands, ping, add event listener, and remove event listener will continue to be required. Now hand back to Gosha. Okay, thank you very much guys for the explanations. Uh, right now we are going to talk a bit about uh, the expanded and improved compliance programs. Uh, together with the TCF uh, version 2.2, we decide to add uh, a few more measures. Can I uh, please um, thank you? Uh, okay, so when it comes to the uh, CMPs, one of the first um, new compliance measure is the controls catalog. That is basically the list of the auditable elements uh, that allow to see if your live installation is in compliance with the TCF policies and technical specifications. It is also a list of the elements that the that are uh, audited by the IAB Europe compliance team. So with using this controls catalog, you can uh, just self assess your installation if it's like in compliance with the requirements or not. Uh, and also the controls catalog includes uh, the enforcement procedures that are related to the, each of the non-compliance, which means that if you see that your uh, life installation is not compliance with the certain uh, auditable element, uh, 
you might be applicable to one of the new compliance uh, enforcement procedures that we have introduced. And here it is really important to underline that uh, one of the sanctions uh, that we have implemented is uh, immediate suspension if the TCF participants is tampering the TC string. Um, uh, so yeah, it is really important to, to underline that. And also we've decided to, um, to develop a new CMP uh, validator. We used the C CMP validator before, but it was not publicly available. Right now, everyone can uh, get this Chrome extension. So also it's a way not only for CMPs to see if your live installation is in accordance with the TC, uh, TCF specifications and policy, but also for the publishers or even the end user to see if the CMP uh, really faithfully uh, record uh, the choices. Um, and it is also important to say that CMPs don't have to reapply for the uh, validation. Uh, it's just a part of the, uh, is the part that need to be fulfilled uh, before the 30th of September. After this uh, date, we are going to uh, use the new uh, policies and technical specifications related to the version 2.2 uh, as a um, way to uh, audit the uh, new uh, improved uh, CMP user inf interfaces. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and now it's the Q&A session. Um, so I think we received some of, uh, some questions. Uh, okay, it seems like the first question actually um, can be um, responded by anyway, but, uh, but maybe Peter will be the best person to assign to it. What is meant by the requirement that framework uh, EU must be displayed prominently, covering most of the website content. Is this requirement in line with EU legal requirements since many EU regulator, regulatory authorities place emphasis on not disturbing the user experience by, by a cookie banner? Thanks, Kosha. Uh, so the question here that's being asked is is based on the list of cat uh, the the controls catalog i believe um because in there there's one of the questions that's being asked is is the ui prominently displayed covering most of the website content and so it refers then to a specific uh, appendix of the policy that basically says that when providing transparency about purposes features and vendors in connection with requesting a user's consent for the same the framework UIs must be displayed prominently and separately from other information, such as the general terms and conditions or the privacy policy, in a modal or banner that covers all or substantially all of the content of the website or app. So this is really about the part about transparency. And so it's about informing. Now, why is there this requirement? Well, in practice, I, I didn't come up with this. This was uh, the, the committees themselves. But what was the what would be the general idea is that authorities want to make sure that when information is being provided, that it is actually understandable, legible, accessible. And so these are key requirements for transparency. And so in that context, it makes sense to say this information has to be displayed prominently and it has to be separate from information that has other considerations that says purely the privacy policy of the website, because that is not the same as providing information about what's happening with in relation to vendors and what they're doing with data. And so I do not believe that there's any contradiction here with the position of the authorities who, who might have been saying, try to fight consent fatigue, which is a different concern because there it's about trying to make sure that people their, their concern is typically making sure that there are no cookie walls, that uh, you're basically not preventing access to content by artificially adding a consent banner. And, and so there, there are different concerns at play regarding transparency. So I do not think here you have to worry about the fact that by saying this has to be displayed prominently, as this information has to be displayed in a way that covers the rest of the content, so it's basically putting the focus on transparency on the information that needs to be provided. That is precisely the aim of data protection authorities. They want to make sure that people see this information 
but they're made aware of it. So it's there's there's no con contradiction in my view. Okay, thank you very much for the explanation. I think the next question is uh, to Toma. Uh, disclosure of the number of vendors that a publisher uh, collects consent for. Should this number include non IAB vendors or only IAB vendors? Yeah, I think I already uh, addressed the the question in, during the the presentation. So uh, it's not a requirement um, to uh, to only uh, display IAB vendors, but it's a requirement to display at least the IAB the number of IAB vendors. Um, and I think CMPs should be able to offer to their customers the same feature for non-IAB vendors. And it should be uh, also um, like the number of vendors. When you're trying to disclose that, the, or like to provide transparency to users regarding the number of vendors, if you only disclose the number of IAB vendors, it feels wrong to a certain extent because um, that's sort of like not providing the, the, the right information since there are other vendors operating on the page. Um, so it could bring confusion. So my 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 view is that uh, CMPs should be uh, providing this feature, um, but then it's ultimately the publisher's decision as to whether uh, non IAB vendors should also be included in that number. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, the next one. When will GVL version three translations uh, available? Uh, okay, so we are working on it but maybe Nino uh, has more insight. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think it should, uh, uh, we should have the first version uh, beginning of next week, uh, if everything goes right. The reason it's a, a little bit uh, long is that we are using uh, so real translators uh, for each uh, language that is supported by the TCF. Um, and also please be aware that uh, even if we start releasing the translation, uh, we will work uh, with local uh, IABs as well as uh, uh, participants and members to improve this translation progressively until the end uh, of the uh, implementation period to make sure that there is no uh, mistakes or confusion uh, in the various translations. Uh, similarly, if you have any uh, suggestion for improvement, uh, please do not hesitate to, to reach out as well on the, on the translation. Thank you very much. Uh, the next one will be addressed to Julia. Uh, what are the illustrations, picture, pictures or real use uh, cases presented in the appendix of the TCF? Yes, exactly. There are those in the appendix and uh, they are indicative examples of possible rare cases and they should help end user to, to understand in practice how their data can be processed and why under the, the related purpose basically. If this answered the question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay, the next one. What is the significant significance and meaning of the requirement of having the minimum contrast ratio of five to one for the text of each call to action on the cookie banner? Will IAB go into this much detail granular granularity during enforcement? So maybe Nino. Um, yeah, sure. So this. Um... Um, requirement is not uh, new. Huh? It was uh, already part of uh, TCFB 2.0. Um, and what it means is that um, the color of the text uh, should have a contrast ratio of uh, at least five to one with the background of the call to action. Uh, this is to make sure that uh, uh, the information is uh, uh, clearly uh, visible to user on both uh, required call to action, uh, which is a call to action to um, accept, uh, so to consent, uh, and the other call to action that is currently required under the TCF is a, uh, is the one that enables them to uh, make more granular choices. Uh, we already go into this much uh, uh, detail uh, during uh, the certification process of CMP. We actually have the software uh, to check uh, the contrast ratio for each call to action. Uh, and we also perform uh, this uh, check uh, automatically uh, with our web crawlers uh, when we audit a live installation of, uh, of CMPs. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, the next one is the long one, and I think everyone can contribute somehow answering this question. Uh, 
uh, how long does it take for the TCF framework to be updated to version 2.2? I'm referring to, uh, and here's the link to GitHub I see, because for many modifications, it is necessary to expose this information to the uh, UI layer. And this is a task that the TCF framework has to offer. If you don't update the framework to TCF version 2.2, how can we go about integrating these changes? Maybe we need to develop our own version of that framework. Okay, so we, release TCF version 2.2 on 16th May. And now uh, the participants has time until the end of September to uh, to implement needed changes, but maybe Nino wants to answer, it, to give more. Um, yeah, because this is a question about the JavaScript library. Uh, so there are also already been some work done uh, on the library to update it with a new requirement of V2.2. Uh, so this is an open source library, which means that uh, it's actually TCF participants that contribute to um, uh, maintaining uh, the code. Uh, I think that right now, actually, Thomas, we have someone from uh, Didomi as well who is working on uh, updating the, uh, the rest of the library. Uh, we are still missing uh, some people uh, to update the Java library. Um, so we are um, uh, trying to find uh, additional contributors for the for the Java library, uh, and then of course there are also other libraries that are not uh, maintained uh, within the uh, Tech Lab uh, repository, uh, but uh, um, that have been made open by other uh, CMP. So for example, there is a Go library. There are like different set of libraries that you can find uh, on GitHub that have been built uh, by different CMP providers. Thanks a lot for the explanation. Uh, can you please share the recording slides from the uh, from the last le lecture uh, vendors? Yeah, both the webinars, uh, this one for CMPs and the previous one for vendors uh, are recorded. So they are going to be uploaded on our website. Also, we decided that the slides also will be uploaded there. So everything will be available on our web website soon. Um, Okay, the next question. Um, can you know, do you want to add something or? Um, on the uh, time frame of TC stream? Um, so I, no, on the previous question? No, no, I just wanted to clean the Q&A. Uh, okay, sorry. I, yeah, sorry. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, what exactly is meant direct CMP validity depre deprecation is that this is string uh, tampered if I understood correctly so I think it goes to you you know uh, yeah so on the tampering of uh, TC string so um, concomitantly to CTFV 2.2 uh, we uh, review the uh, enforcement procedure of the TCF compliance program uh, and one violation that is uh, clearly serious is when a TCF participant whether it's a CMP or vendor uh, falsify or tamper with a TC string, which means that in practice, uh, for example, uh, they would, you know, change uh, consent, well, refusal of consent to consent, uh, which means that uh, user choices are not properly reflected and it puts uh, all participants at risk of non-compliance and at risk of uh, processing data illegally, uh, which is why uh, the corresponding procedure for this specific violation is a, a immediate suspension of the participant, so immediate suspension of the CMP or the vendor uh, for a minimum of, I think, of uh, two weeks. Um, and um, and uh, it will be also associated with a public notification of non-compliance, um, simply because this is, um, as I said, something that really undermines the utility of the, of the framework. And uh, as a participant, I expect that everyone would want to know if a partner uh, is engaging is, uh, in that kind of behavior. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, the next one, I think uh, Peter can answer. If a publisher lists TCF, Google and other uh, vendors, uh, surely the first layer count of total vendors should be all vendors, not just TCF. It sounded, um, ambiguous earlier, could uh, IAB Europe confirm it's all vendors? So it's it's important to remember that the TCF is a policy, well, a standard with the policy that only concerns the TCF itself. There's nothing in the remit 
of the TCF that's meant to cover what ha what's happening outside of the TCF. And so that's why in the requirements regarding the, the number of vendors, it's specifically in the context of the TCF. So it relates to the vendors in the context of the TCF. It's not relevant for, for the TCF to include obligations in relation to non-TCF vendors. That's outside of the scope. But it is relevant for everyone who's using the TCF, who's implementing it, to then figure out, well, I've got non-TCF vendors as well. How do I basically integrate that? How do I reuse some of the work I'm doing in relation to the TCF to also cover what I'm doing with non-TCF vendors? And so this is why Tom, Tom I was saying earlier that he would he would personally recommend that you try to be consistent, that you try to have one number that covers TCF vendors and non-TCF vendors. And so this is something that's up to every publisher to determine how do they want to manage their own transparency obligations, because ultimately it's their obligation to be transparent. And and so this is this is why it's not in the policies that it's supposed to cover non-TCF vendors, but it makes sense for every publisher to try to think, maybe I want to do that. But ultimately it's their, it's their choice. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, how can we find this follow-up blog with all the seminars? So everything is going to be published on our website. Uh, website, sorry. And I don't know, maybe Helen or any, uh, can you put a link to our website on the chat? It will be, I guess, ah, okay, someone is typing the answer. So yeah, it will be, all will be published on our website. Uh, okay, the next one. Uh, do CMP need to include sub processors or sub vendors under the count of vendors or just the number of vendors who ask for consent and not the subsidiaries? Uh, so I don't know, either Peter or Toma. Well, from, uh, if we think about these transparency obligations, what is the purpose here of the number of vendors? It's basically to inform a user about the range of other controllers who would be getting data if basically they say yes to everything or they don't say no, whether it's based on legitimate interest and so on. So it's about managing people's expectations so that they understand how many vendors are actually covered in this list. Now, if a vendor has a processor that processor is basing the processing on whatever the controller is doing and so the processor doesn't have to be mentioned they're not they're not using processing personal data for their own purposes and so it's all tied to that one vendor who is a controller if a vendor has multiple subsidiaries that are each processing the data separately then at one point there will be the question who is actually getting that consent or who to who, who is basically talking about legitimate interest being used as a legal ground? Because that will be the identification of who is the controller. So if a vendor has lots of subsidiaries who are each individually a controller, then maybe they need to think about how they are managing their structure for obtaining consent. If, they're all, if consent is being concentrated by one controller, that is maybe the head of the, 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 the group, the, the headquarters of the group, then suddenly it's not so relevant as a question because they are the ultimate controller. So it's not something where you can say in advance, any subsidiary has to be listed or no subsidiary has to be listed. This really depends on how they have managed their own structure internally within the group. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next one, maybe Frances can uh, answer. Uh, so the cookie wall will be illegal? Not sure I understand the question. I, I think it's based on what I was saying earlier about the position of authorities regarding transparency and displaying things prominently, uh, because I think it was related to, to that, that the question came up. So I think I, I can I can pick up, and then if anyone wants to to add something, they're welcome. So we have across Europe, we have different authorities that are taking different positions regarding the idea of a cookie wall. 
Some authorities are saying they don't want any cookie walls because they think that this creates an invalid consent. Some others are saying yes in certain circumstances. Just recently, we had the, the French authority that published guidance on how to do lawful cookie walls. And so ultimately, it comes down to what you are doing, or rather what your vendors and publishers are doing in their own jurisdictions. And so they have to then figure out which laws do I have to comply with? And if it's something that in where the authorities have produced guidance, specific guidance about cookie walls, then obviously they have to take that into account. Or if there's no guidance or if they want to challenge that guidance, then they say, well, too bad. That's not relevant for me. So it's it's not something where there's a broad EU position at this stage on cookie walls. There's still a lot of diff difficulties in finding a common position. OK, thank you. Then Maybe I... just to come back on the TCF policy. So there is a dedicated derogation we introduced uh, following uh, case law uh, from authority that confirms the legality under some circumstances of uh, paywalls. Uh, so there is a specific derogation that allows a publisher to make use of this uh, particular installation. Um, so a publisher uh, relying on a, a paywall or um, providing an alternative to user um, who refuse to consent um, uh, can still use the, the TCF. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, okay, the next one, I think it will be again to Nino. Will there be an update to the uh, JC library at the GitHub? Yes, so uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are working um, to get um, the uh, different libraries uh, updated uh, by uh, uh, contributors, uh, so participating companies for, uh, for the most part. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one, can IP address be used uh, for the purpose of generating a cookie? The IP address itself is not stored. So maybe Peter? Well, I, I'm not sure that's a specifically TCF related question. Uh, it's more of a broader legal question. Uh, and and so I, I don't know if it's really the, the scope of this webinar to answer that. Uh, but I, I, I do recommend uh, when, when, it, when we're talking about IP addresses, uh, we were there, there are ongoing cases uh, before the Court of Justice, notably regarding the notion of personal data, and that will have an influence on, on the notion on what can be done with IP addresses. So I can only recommend getting in touch with a, a legal advisor if you want to have more, more answers about that. Thank you. Uh, does the number of vendors need to be adjusted in real time or can it be static? So maybe Thomas? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, it can be both. There's no requirement in the, the policies of the TCF to, to, um, to make it dynamic or, or to keep it static. Uh, but I think I addressed uh, this point as well in my um, when I was presenting the, the slide. Um, it's probably best to make it dynamic because, you know, um, uh, it may not be the, the same person that's dealing with the, the, the consent notice or the consent UI um, that will be uh, dropping a new cookie or like make, dropping a new tag on the page. And so the all of a sudden, like the, the number of vendors can change uh, and the person in charge of the CMP notice is actually not going to be aware of it, uh, which is why it's easier when it's actually coming from the CMP itself, like recognizing how many vendors are actually operating on the page. Uh, that would be my advice, uh, but again, there's no requirement. Uh, perhaps just to add something, and it's tied to also the, the newest question that was raised, that is, if there's a change in the number of vendors, do we still need to regenerate consent? Because if you have a static number, and it gets to the point that Thomas was making, you could have two separate teams who are managing the question. One team managing the number, the static number that they're basically putting into the UI and another one who's basically supposed to feed that information, how many vendors do we have, who's actually maintaining the relationship with all of these vendors. And, and so this is, there are, all, there are very often communication issues. And so that is something that the publishers themselves have to work on. They have to try to figure out how do we 
create a better communication internally so that the information is up to date. Now, what's happening typically is that um, is that these processes are not as structured as they could be. So then there's a question, how do you make it live? This And so it's it becomes more complicated because you do have to then have an integration with your CMP at the CMP level that allows you to have a dynamic way of maintaining the list. If you don't have that, it's still possible to be compliant, obviously, because you can still have that static number. But then if I see 20 on the list and bit, while I was seeing this list, there's actually a 21st one who's been approved by that, that publisher. I am not giving consent or expressing uh, any preference regarding legitimate interest in relation to that 21st. And so this is this is this means that you are more limited. That person has only seen information regarding 20, not 21. And so it is, it gets to the point about how do you manage consent in relation to additional vendors who are coming in? And so you do have to think about how you manage this process. How your publishers need to think about how they manage that. Vendors have to check what do publishers have in place and CMPs are there also to facilitate the process. So it's it's a really important question because I have not given my consent to that 20 to that 21st uh, vendor who comes into the list. So that 21st vendor cannot use my, cannot do anything based on my consent because I haven't given it. Having said that, maybe uh, uh, we can add that th there are recommendations and guidelines from data protection authorities from time to time regarding this uh, specific topic. And so that's why it, ultimately I think it should be the publisher's decision as to whether uh, consent should be recollected or gathered uh, once again. Uh, based on multiple like multiple factors, but also uh, data protection authority guidelines on the on the matter. Okay, thank you. Uh, could you please cl clarify that in the initial layer, should we specify the number of all vendors or list the number of concerned vendors against the relevant processing purposes, features, and special features? Uh, I think again, Toma or Peter. So maybe I can uh, I can try to answer. Uh, so it needs to be the number of vendors for which uh, the publisher establish a legal basis. Uh, so whether it's a legitimate input or consent. Uh, so it does not need to be the number of vendors that have been registered. Uh, and in the GVL, it's only the subset of vendors that the publisher has selected and for which it established uh, transparency and consent. Okay, thank you. Uh, when does perhaps the... perhaps briefly, if the question was also about whether it's per subdivision, this is really one master number, and so it's not it's not requiring you to have in the first layer information for each purpose. This is the number of vendors that are associated with that that purpose. So it's really just one number. Okay, thank you. Uh, when does publishers need to have the CMP ready to launch? In some countries, there is no need. Uh, there is no a need of CMP today. Uh, okay, so basically the implementation deadline is the 30th September. So before this day, all the live installations should be in compliance with the TCF version 2.2. But maybe you know wants to add something. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, yeah, publishers need to have a, a, a CMP that is compliant with the 2.2 uh, by September 30. Uh, in relation to the countries uh, where there is no need of a CMP uh, today, uh, when I, I guess that that would fall in any case uh, out of scope of the of the TCF, uh, the TCF is intended to facilitate compliance with a. Uh, E-privacy and GDPR, so the scope would be a publisher established in the EU, uh, as well as publisher outside the EU that have uh, users uh, situated in the EU. Uh, so if, as a publisher, you're not concerned by this uh, territorial scope, uh, then you're probably not concerned by uh, TCF. Or, um, that's all I, I can say, I think, on that one. 
Thank you. Uh, are there plans for standardized API interface for the number of vendors? Would be easiest if the CMPs provide this info, including a custom non IAB vendors? So maybe Nino or Peter? I think that for the most part, and I will let uh, the speaker uh, discuss this point, uh, CMP will provide tool uh, to their publisher client so that this number is computed uh, automatically uh, rather than manually, but I will let uh, Doma or Julia or uh, Frances answer uh, this one as well. Yeah, I can answer. Um, yeah, I, I expect CMPs will provide this info so that um, via an API so that you can sort of have that number uh, coming directly from your vendor list um, in your first layer message. So yeah, I expect um, all CMPs will um, provide tools for this or publishers. Okay. Uh, so it's for now the last question. Do we need to reconsent users with the TCF 2.0 string by 30th September? Um, so, I can take this one, yeah. I think. <laughs> um, so there is no obligation to reconsent users. Um, I think the existing TCF um, version strings will be, um, for existing users, will be available for up to a year. Um, however, um, obviously there are some changes to like the legal basis for um, purposes three to six, I believe. So if any publishers obviously had that set to legitimate interest before, then that may trigger um, some kind of a reconsent because um, you obviously um, will need to represent, represent the, the message to the user again. Um, but I will just um, throw it to Peter and make sure that I've covered that correctly. It's entirely correct. And, and so ultimately it depends on whether you are, or rather the publisher, and together with the vendors, whether basically there are any changes to the way that they're operating uh, as a result of TCF 2.2 being rolled out. And so if nothing is impacted, that doesn't change consent. It's just a question of whether some want to use that as an occasion to obtain a new consent that's always possible and and so because obviously there are new there's new there's new information that's being provided and so it can be useful but so ultimately this is a question for each publisher on the one hand but also for the vendors themselves if they are impacted by some of the changes from an operational perspective this could basically mean that there's a new consent that's needed and perhaps uh, just to to add another layer, um, what what is probably going to make it like tricky for publishers to take that decision is that uh, there were uh, certain vendors relying on legitimate interest for purposes three, four, five, and six, um, and since in the version two point two of the TCF now, uh, it's um, the the those purposes can only be um, used uh with consent uh that means the the consent was not obtained uh, for those uh vendors and so perhaps depending on how many of them you are using as a as a publisher you may want to recollect consent but that's not a tcf requirement okay thank you very much and i think it was the last question brilliant thank you so much um with that, if we don't have any more questions, I think we can wrap up. We've just put in the chat box for all attendees just to link to the recent blog article that we did that's got the previous two webinars in. And as I think we've mentioned about 10 times, we will definitely be uploading these recordings with the accompany slides to our website. You should all be on our uh, mailing list. If you're not, please get in contact with framework at ibeurope.tcf. It's not .tcf, it's .eu. Uh, where we have a TCF newsletter that goes out once a month and all of the latest information support materials is always featured in that. Um, so a big thank you for all of our speakers today to Julia, Toma, uh, Francis, Ninon, Peter and Gosha. We do appreciate you giving up your part of your day, uh, your actual day jobs to come and join us today and to go through all of these things with, um, with, with all of the attendees. And a big thank you to all of the attendees for um, dialing in and we look forward to seeing you very soon and all the best with the TCF 2.2 implementation.
Thank you very much. Enjoy your afternoon.